Many bemoan the decline of the church. We hear a steady stream of reports about how droves of people, especially younger generations, are abandoning Christianity. But new research shows that unchurched Americans are surprisingly more receptive and open to the Christian faith than is commonly assumed. A study of 2,000 unchurched people across the country reveals that the unchurched are still remarkably open to faith conversations and the church. On this episode of Everlasting Love, our guest will reveal how he has helped to crack the cultural code to unlock the receptivity of millennials, nuns, and irreligious people. Stay tuned. Hi friends, welcome to the Everlasting Love Program. I'm your host, Barbara Karpuzian, and I'm delighted that you decided to join us. You know, we want you to know that God loves you with an everlasting love. You know, the word says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, we are privileged to live. We are privileged to have been born, to exist. But not only do we exist here in this world, on this earth, in this mortal body, but for those of us who accept Jesus Christ, who are willing to confess our sins, the Bible says if we confess our sins to him, that he is faithful and just to forgive us, that not only will we live here, but we will live with him for eternity. Just wanna offer you that today, that you would consider him. You don't have to pray a fancy prayer, but you can lift your eyes up to heaven and just say, Jesus, I wanna to get to know you. I recognize that I have fallen short, but that you have come to give me life and that more abundantly. You know, during the course of the program, you'll have an opportunity to uh, see on, on, on the screen there, our YouTube channel, um, our Facebook page. Uh, we would love for you to uh, get to know us a little bit better, maybe send us a message, give us a like, uh, see some of our um, older programs, and maybe share uh, our programs with others. We believe that uh, not only will they bless you, but they will bless others. That's why we do this. We don't do it for ourselves, but we do this that God would be glorified and that your life would be impacted. So I'm uh, really excited to do this program. Uh, I have a couple of my own millennials and we're gonna be talking about millennials. I love millennials. I hope that you do too. <laughs> so on the program with me today is Rick Richardson. Rick, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks, Barb. It's Rick so is Dr. Yep. Uh, Richardson. Ah. Um, he is also <laughs> the director, and I wanna get this right, of the Billy Graham Center Institute and its Church Evangelism Initiative. He's also a professor of evangelism and leadership at Wheaton College. Did I get that all right? The you Wheaton did. College Graduate School. Yes, you did. And okay. I get paid for doing that kind of fun stuff. Okay, well, that's great. <laughs> right, Getting paid is very important. <laughs> So I am really thrilled. I, I actually heard you um, on another program and um, was really drawn to this topic uh, because I, um, I, think, I think that today uh, some of the myths might be debunked because I think that we have some ideas about to the unchurched, mm -hmm. the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, mm -hmm. the term that you use, and, and millennials. Um, we have some ideas about those groups and their relationship to the church that you're gonna help us kind of navigate uh, through, kind of unpack. Um, but, but before we get there, and, and, and I do want to say just right now at the top of the program that 
we're going to be making reference quite a bit to Rick Richardson's book called You Found Me and it's new research on how unchurched nuns, millennials, and irreligious, I like that word, irreligious, are surprisingly open to Christian faith. But before we do that, we want to get to know Rick a little bit. So before you became all these amazing things, <laughs> tell, us, tell us where the journey began. Yeah, for me, I uh, did not grow up in a Christian home, and uh, I know a lot of people do. I think it's a big advantage. I, I think one of the things that's powerful about growing up in a home that wasn't Christian is that then that gives me a huge heart for people like me who didn't know God growing up uh, to kind of have a passion for other people to encounter God in the way I did. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we might have attended a Unitarian church, maybe a couple of liberal churches, and they had good values, but there was no spiritual core that I ever found in those churches. Mm. And so I remember the process for me started when I was in high school and I went to the beach. One of my friends just said, hey Rick, uh, we're going to the beach for a week. Uh, you know, beaches are fun, ocean is fun, uh, the lots of you know guys, girls are going to be there. You'd love it. And they didn't, they neglected to tell me that if I went every night there would be special services and ah. there would be an evangelist. And okay. so I thought, the beach, that sounds okay. wonderful. So okay. I kind of got tricked into it, but I'm glad I did, uh, you know, yeah. in retrospect. I don't think that's a good, bait and switch is never good, but I guess it worked on me a little right. bit. And so but I, God was ordering I think that's it. your steps here. Right? I think yeah. that's it. And so I remember my the first night I had to go, my arms were crossed and I was, because uh, I'm from a family that thought believing in God and following Christ and becoming an evangelical, you know, a, a, a passionate follower of Jesus was for uneducated people, rural people. It flew against science. Like I had all these beliefs coming in. Where do you think those came in? Well, I, you know, I think it's a larger part of our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, one of my earlier books was on the culture shift from modern to postmodern. Mm -hmm. And to kind of look at the shift for when we started trusting science more yes. than faith. Right. And we started to think science and faith contradict each other, which I don't think they do. Right. I don't believe right. they do. Well, but that's I, what we teach, too, it, it's right? It's what we teach. It's what our schools mm -hmm. do. And I did believe that. Uh, when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, you know, with my arms crossed, listening to this evangelist, and then the second night they got, you know, I sat back a little bit and started listening. And by Thursday night, uh, there was a guy by the name of Jake Kessler, actually, who okay. used to be president of Taylor University. Okay. Uh, he was preaching that night because he was president of Youth for Christ at that oh, point. Oh, wow. And so he just called us to Christ and to give our lives and to trust Christ for forgiveness. And I remember I remember walking out on the boardwalk in Ocean City, New Jersey, saying, I don't know, I, uh, you know, and I really struggled a lot till about three in the morning because unlike kids who grow up in Christian homes, whose parents can't wait for them to come home and say, wow, I committed my life to Christ. I knew when I went back to my parents, they were going to be horrified. Mm. And so it was a costly decision for me. But I made that commitment, and I'll never forget, Barb, the next day when I went out onto the beach, my group leader waved me over. He'd heard what had happened, and he said to me, Rick, I heard you made a decision last night. And I was like, I didn't know what this was about. He was like, a, he had gathered about 300 people on the beach. Had, had you told anyone you made this I decision? I had. Oh, okay. And then, but my friend, dang him, you know, had told the group leader. Okay. And so I show up on the beach in the morning, and the group leader calls me over, and he hands me a microphone like I'm three hours old in Christ. Okay. And he hands me a mo microphone and he says, okay, now tell all these folks what <laughs> God's done for you. And yeah. I, I don't think I got a word out coherently at all. Okay. But the lesson that got drilled into my heart is as soon as you encounter God and yes. commit to God, you have a story. Yes. You have a witness to yes. make. Yes. And it's not 10 years later once you know all the answers to mm -hmm. the tough questions. Mm -hmm. It is as soon yes. as God shows up in your life, yeah. you have a witness. And so I got, I stumbled over it all. And then 
that guy invited all of us who had come to Christ that week to go be baptized in the, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. and 40. At the beach. At the beach. <laughs> at the beach. Imagine that. And 40 of us wow. uh, kind of uh, confessed Christ wow. and were baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's, that's kind of where it all began. Yeah. So, so you can imagine, like, that gave my life purpose. I went home and I shared with, I went to my two brothers and I hadn't learned how to witness, how to share my faith. I just said, man, you guys don't want to go to hell, do you? And they said, no, no. And I said, oh, good, then pray this prayer. And unfortunately, you know, it was, it was good zeal. Unfortunately, they had to do it again later because they sure. didn't, you know, it wasn't sure. done very well. But I did, like my life was kind of set on fire. Mm -hmm. And ever since, I've had this huge passion to want to see people come to faith. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, part of the book came out of that passion. Yes. And also the sense that the church these days mm -hmm. is we aren't sharing our faith yeah. that much. Well, you just said you said something and I don't know if I can um, uh, rephrase it, so you'll have to correct me. You yeah, said yeah. you you were part of a church or you grew up in a, a family and attended church that had, you know, you, there were some uh, core values, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But you said there, there was like a spiritual component was missing. Yeah. And I think that's important for people to hear because it's not just enough to have like a moral code yeah. or a set of values, but there has to be this like this spiritual undergirding yeah. of truth, which yeah. we say is Jesus Christ, yeah. because he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so I thought that was interesting when you stated that. Yeah, I think often uh, people think if I go to church and if I'm a pretty good person, haven't killed anybody, right. you know, I haven't cheated on my wife, you know, and recently, you know, like people come up with a sense of if I'm a pretty good person, I'll, right. I'll go to heaven. And if I get to church and I remember Billy Graham, who our institute, our center is named after. I remember Billy Graham at one point saying in one of his messages, just because you're in a garage doesn't mean you're a car, sure. right? Yeah. If just because you're in a church doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges in our culture is there are a lot of people who would describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. Yes. And what they mean is they don't like the organized religion mm -hmm. thing, but mm -hmm. they do have a faith. Yes. And that's what people need to understand is yeah. at the heart of it is this right. centered relationship with mm -hmm. God through Christ. Yeah. And and that goes back to the fact that we are we are spirit, soul and body. Yeah. And so right. that there's there there's a there's that desire for some spiritual connection. Yeah. Um but so so you 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 you're in high school when this happened or in college when this I'm happened? I'm in high school and, and then I didn't get, nobody disciple me. It's like yes. one, of the, one of my passions is, yes. is uh, it's not just about getting people to pray a prayer yes. or raise a hand or say something or, it's also actually about making disciples, yes. right? Making, the, making followers of Jesus, people who grow up into Christ. Yes. And, and so to me, you can't put, pull them apart. Right. Evangelism, discipleship, reaching out and, and and making people who have the, the values of Jesus, those all mm -hmm. go together. Yeah. You talk and, about that in your book. I, I do, I do. You, you did some kind of a poll of yeah. churches that offer yeah. like some kind of a workshop or class or something um, once, a, once a believer or once somebody professes belief. Yeah. And what did you find? Well, well, I mean, so one of the things we did in my research is we did survey 2,000 unchurched people. So we have a, we'll talk about some of yes. that stuff today yes. um, on the show. But we also uh, surveyed 4,500 Protestant churches in America. Mm -hmm. And then we talked to 60 of of the pastors of those churches mm -hmm. who were really seeing a lot of people come to Christ. Yes. And then we talked to previously unchurched people mm -hmm. who had come to Christ at those churches. And we identified predictive factors for churches that are reaching people and discipling them. Okay. It's that combination. Right, right, right. And, uh, and those predictive factors, the, the second most important was uh, that you know, the second, the one that was the second biggest predictor was churches have an immediate next step. Yes. Once people visit a church to follow up 
and help them commit to Christ and follow Christ. Yes. So yeah. that's what you're yeah, yeah. you're talking about. Well, I, and I think that's very powerful. Like I feel a real great vibe here because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's my discipleship <laughs> is my heart. Yeah. And I remember being in a church that we loved dearly for about ten years. This was many years ago, and I remember one of the pastors after the altar call, and he's a wonderful man, the, the you know, people would come up and they give their mm -hmm. lives to the mm -hmm. Lord. And then he would look out and he would say, and now I see ushers and I see children's workers and I see, yeah. and in my heart, I was like, well, wait, yeah. Jesus didn't do that. He, he caught, you know, he, he got those disciples and then he taught them. And so I remember at a dinner that we were at, I had turned it to him and I said, hey, Pastor Jack, I, I, I've been wanting to just say this to you. I love you. I know your heart when you say that. But in my heart, it's like, you know, you when you catch the fish, then you got to clean them and you need yeah. a time to disciple. And, and it was funny because the next time there was an altar call, he changed. <laughs> and that Way church did have that connecting <laughs> class right. like you talk about. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so you take us then, so you, 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 you know, through college and did you walk with the Lord that whole time? What did, you know, just give us a snippet, like what did your like faith walk look yeah. like before you eventually became this doctor and author yeah. and director and all of that? Well, well, so I got on fire for Jesus for a while, but I didn't have anybody pour into my life. I didn't have the next steps class. Yes. And so I didn't learn to study scripture for myself. I, I really didn't learn much about the, the kind of thinking about the faith. I didn't learn good answers to the questions I was facing in school and especially when mm -hmm. I went to college. Mm -hmm. I didn't get discipled or, you know, I didn't get poured into that. Okay. Way. And so when I got to college, um, I had all these questions I couldn't handle sure. because I just attended church but not been shaped and formed in the faith. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why I have a passion for both of those. Yes. And in college, I, it, was a, it was a fun thing because I connected to a campus group. It was, it was a group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Oh, yes. it's, a, uh -huh. it's a campus ministry that yep. disciples people. And there are a few of them, yep. a crew yep. and navigators and Chi Alpha. Thank and God for those. A number of others. Yeah. And I, so I came into college and by the time I got halfway through my freshman year, I was arguing people out of faith because I hadn't been helped, oh, disciple. Wow. Wow. And I had these doubts, I had these struggles, I had these questions. I knew the error, I knew parts of scripture that had errors it seemed like to me at the time. Okay. <laughs> I, like I didn't have good answers. Okay. And so I kind of fell away, and I Sound was like, like Paul. Well, I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I can. I mean, it, but he was right. Saul. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I didn't kill anybody, yeah, but anyway, no, thank uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> right? But but I still uh, was after killing mm. people's faith. And I remember uh, uh, coming to a book table that was out on my campus. Uh, it was an outreach table within a varsity, and I thought, oh, some Christians, I'm going to take them apart. I, I know and. And I asked questions, and these folks had been discipled. They had some good answers. I remember Jim was the guy I ran into. He had some great answers. But the other thing is that when he didn't know, he didn't, uh, he didn't get defensive. He didn't give me some uh, ir you know, non-thinking answer sure. like, oh, you just got to have faith. And, right, you know. right, right. He said, I don't know that, but I'd love to kind of explore that mm. and could we meet again next week and wow, talk about okay, that. Wow, okay, great. And then here's the, here's kind of the funny thing. So he helped me along and then about the third time we met, he said, hey, why don't you work the book table with me? And we'll kind of field people's questions together and Jim asked me to work the outreach table before I had committed myself back to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there going, well, sure, but I mean, you know, you know, like, what am I going to tell you afraid people? I might, like, I'm... deter people? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and Jim just was like, no, I, I think you're making, you know, you're on a journey. You're taking great steps. We've had some good conversations. I think you could probably, re, you know, reflect back some of what you and I have talked mm. about. Um, and then then he invited me into a small group. And uh, yes. I tell you, that that then was the discipling, yes. the bringing up in Christ that I needed. Mm. And from that day to this, uh, you know, yes. we all struggle with doubts at times. We all have yes. hard things happen. Yes. But I have followed Jesus from that day to yes. this. And I have married 
outreach and discipleship. Uh, I, I think, you know, here's another way people pull them apart. Sometimes evangelism, you know, outreach people pull them apart because all they do is try to get people yes. numbers of I'm people. I'm an evangelist. All right, well, yes, right. respond, yeah. respond. I, yeah. 50 people raise their hands yeah. or yeah. pray to prayer. Or, but sometimes discipleship people do the same thing. Mm. What they do is they say, discipleship is reading the Bible, praying and fellowshipping, and it all gets inward oriented. Yeah. And it doesn't get focused on helping people to become witnesses. Yes, yeah. And I don't see a single disciple that Jesus developed who wasn't also a witness. So, yeah, so yeah. that's the, like, they gotta be married and stay yes. married. Oh, I'm just, this is so refreshing. Um, and we've had, it's interesting because we've had some similar yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, experiences, journey probably. experiences because yeah. my questions were in high school and then it was in college, even though I think I got saved during confirmation and yeah. Catholic church. And yeah. by the way, too, can we tell everybody that you are, can we, I'm going to, <laughs> that you're also an Anglican priest yes. as well, yeah. who has operated in healing ministry. And yeah. so um, that's, you know, so powerful. Um, so we are talking uh, to Rick Richardson, and we're talking about his book, You Found Me. And this is new research on how unchurched nuns, millennials, and irreligious are surprisingly open to Christian faith. So I'd really like to get into this uh, a little bit more, kind of unpack it a little bit more. Um, do you want to define for us quickly these different groups? Like most of us probably know what unchurched is, right? Yeah. Um, the nuns. Who are yeah. the nuns? The N O N E S. Yeah. So for purposes of research, just just to be clear, unchurched is anybody who hasn't attended a church in the last six months. Oh, okay. So that's okay. how we defined unchurched. Okay. So some people might have been away six months. Okay. And some people might have been away 60 years. Okay. That's the whole range of unchurched. Nuns are people who on a survey, when asked about their religious preference, respond either atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. Okay. So nuns mean no religious Okay, affiliation Identi or yep. identification. Yep, okay. it, it, you know, it's uh, if you're asked, do you have a religious identification? The answer is none. Okay. So that's why we call them nuns. Okay. And they're the fastest growing segment of the population in terms of religious categories that surveyors use okay. in the country. They now have outstripped uh, gone past evangelicals. Evangelicals are about 25% uh, of the population. Nuns have now gone above that and are 26 or 27% hmm. of the American population. So fastest okay. growing group. And okay. that's why we got to understand what they are because yeah. they're the people we're called to reach. Yeah. And so that's the nuns. Um, and then there's millennials. Millennials are a generation, 1981 to 1996. That's when they were born. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of researchers will say 9-11, uh, right? Oh, September okay. 11th, uh, 2001 okay. is a date that rings powerfully for all millennials. Uh, you know, the, the youngest millennial was five oh, okay. and the oldest was 20, uh, 22 or something like okay. that. So. It's the 9-11 generation in one, in one sense. Okay. And uh, when the world shifted in that direction. All right. And uh, so that's millennials. And it's a very significant size cohort. Uh, people born after 96 uh, are either called Generation Z yes. or iGen. You know, they're, they're still, yes. uh, who's going to gonna, figure it out. Yeah, right? who's going to get to name them and, and yeah. where are they going to be? But yeah. they're all emerging adults. And, okay. uh, but millennials, uh, the news has all been bad. You know, they're yeah. leaving church. They're drifting yeah. away. And, and who are the irreligious? So, and irreligious uh, are, is just a broader term that would say people, they might be spiritual, they might not, but they don't identify in general with religion oh, and with okay. organized religion. Okay. So they would say, you know, I'm not religious. I'm, I don't like organized religion. I'm not into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but they might say they're spiritual. Yes. So that doesn't mean non-spiritual, sure. but it means they It could they be don't. dabbling in something else. That's right. It could okay. be a cult. It could be new age. It could actually uh, be Christian. There are some Christians who mm -hmm. would say, I'm not religious. Okay. Uh, so irreligious, but but you know that's a very tiny percent of the category. Yeah. That's not the main uh, category. Because yeah. I don't. I would. I'm. You know. I'm certainly a Christian, and I yeah. probably wouldn't say I'm religious. Right. I would say I'm in a relationship. Right. You know, with Christ. So. That's right. uh, yeah. So talk about some of the surprising 
yeah. things that you discovered yeah. in this uh, research process. And I, I, I do want you to, if you can, also, I, I remembered a graph, and you can correct me, um, where you know it appears that um, Christianity is growing. It right. looks like it's growing at a lesser rate, though, than when I looked at the graph for these other groups that yeah. seem to be growing at a quicker rate. Like it, yeah. the you know the other one's a little flatter, and so I, you know talk about that and yeah. some of this, the other research pieces that you yeah. stood out to you. Yeah, so so I will. I I don't want to lose our our uh, audience, so I want to set a quick frame. Please, a, a please, quick context. let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, I I uh, recently moved from Wheaton, where Wheaton College is, uh, where I teach. I recently moved from Wheaton, uh, Wheaton uh, where I lived for a long time. Mm -hmm. I moved down to the South Loop in Chicago. Oh, uh, know it well. I, I know yes. you do, yeah. And I love, I love the city. Mm -hmm. Lived there for a little bit too, so yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, uh, your brother had told me that. Yes. So, and, and I, I uh, you know, we love the city. We're in the South Loop. The South Loop is kind of a cool community because it's right on the south edge of the Loop, which is downtown. That's yes. where the Art Institute is. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know all this and where Millennium, Millennium Park, Park is mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, and then from 800 to 2000 or so. So the next couple miles after the Loop is what's called the South Loop. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of like the downtown. And we're kind of like the south side of Chicago. Yes. Like we, we kind of have a mix of both. Yeah. And it's where Columbia College is, yes. lots of artists. So I would have expected when I moved from Wheaton down to the South Loop, I would have expected, ah, you know, I'm, you know, in Wheaton, everybody's religious. A lot of people go to church, you know, and there was some truth to that. I, I'd say our neighborhood, uh, a third of us were going to kind of evangelical or Bible churches or that kind of church. Another third of us were going to the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And then there was another third, like our Persian neighborhood neighbors who were Zoroastrian. Okay. And then on the corner, there was the one uh, kind of uh, very uh, proactively non-Republican family. Like okay, they were like yeah, super right. Democrats <laughs> and they, they wanted that in everybody's face, right? Okay. And, and uh, uh, so, so, so that it, was your diversity. That was my <laughs> diversity, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And I thought, oh, and we had conversations about Christ. With, there was a lot of this conversation, but it was interesting. We'd had a number of those conversations, and people were a little bit locked into their group. So it was, in some ways, harder to see people move and influence each other. I moved to the South Loop, and I would have expected fewer spiritual people, because it's all nuns, it's all millennials, um, it's all people who don't, you know, mostly don't attend church on, on Sundays. So I thought there'd be less receptivity. And to set it up even more, we'll talk maybe a little more about this, but we had a condo, and on our condo floor, so this was different than Wheaton. Half the couples on the floor were gay couples. And I, it was a new kind of cultural yes. context for us. So I thought, well, people, you know, this is different. And I bet they're against the church. I bet they're like uh, against Christian faith. I bet they don't trust us. I bet spiritual conversations are going to be a lot tougher. tougher. And what was amazing, and so then I'll jump into the research. Yes, I wanted yes. to set that. Please. What, yeah. what was amazing was the folks on my floor and all around me and in my neighborhood were more receptive mm -hmm. than the people that I left in Wheaton. Look at that. And, and a part of it was because the people I lived next to in Wheaton had already sort of built their fences, yes. established their positions, yes. mm -hmm. and decided their preconceptions of people. Sure. And by, by the time I got to the city, uh, there wasn't nearly as much of a church memory. Yeah. And there wasn't nearly as much of a church stereotype. Yeah, yeah. And so Good. they didn't expect, they didn't know what I would say next. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, conversations became real, authentic, and people moved and were receptive. That's a kind of an indicator of what our research showed. Mm. So, and, and part of what our research did is it explored the myths that people had mm -hmm. um, about uh, what's going on in our larger culture. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the myths is, for instance, that, uh, and I saw this stat, 
6% of millennials are, uh, have, are you know, who, who, who attend church mm -hmm. have left the church and are not coming back. Now, now think about that. Let me say that again. It's huge. 96%. Huge. Yes. I saw that uh, statistic first online at a reputable source. Mm -hmm. Then I saw it a couple days later at another, you know, reputable source. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it everywhere. And the last time I saw it, this website had used it to alarm us all, yeah. create panic, and, uh, uh, and, and had used it to sell their book and, and, and to get people to come to their conference. Mm. Now, here's the thing about that statistic. It, was this a, a, a religious conference? It was. It was on millennials and how to reach them. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, now here's the thing about that 96% statistic. It went everywhere. Everybody quoted it, including very credible sources and mm -hmm. people, and it was completely bogus. Wow. It was a statistic that, like, I, I dug in. Part of the research of the book was I, I was like, how did people get that? Yeah, so how I, did they? I know. So I dug into the statistic. It turned out some researcher uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, or 15 to 20 years ago, went to three towns in Ohio that were almost completely Catholic and asked 100 people, kind of just off the street, in three towns in Ohio, what their background was. And it turned out 96% of the people, most of them Catholic, who had mm -hmm. been Catholic, weren't mm -hmm. attend, hadn't attended a church in six months. So. The 96% statistic represented as representing all of America. How deceptive is that? <laughs> represented three How deceptive small is that? towns in Ohio wow. that were predominantly Catholic. And so the folks that were using this, were they aware of that? <laughs> no! Because what happens yeah. with bad news is yes. bad news travels fast. Yes. Well, and I think that's a really good uh, message to our audience to be careful. <sighs> when you just hear these like data points, right? Make sure that, and we, it's funny, I am a, I'm a previous educator too, and we would tell our students, make sure yeah. that you're looking at primary sources and yes. that you really are, are understanding where these data points are coming from because then you can develop this whole idea, right? Yes. Based on something that is completely false. That's right. Here's what's, uh, so let me tell you the real statistic. Tell us the real I'm statistic. I'm going to tell you the real. So 96% okay. leave and never come back. Here's the real statistic. 54% either stay, that's 26% of them, or come back mm. after a year or so away. 54%. That's, that's a much better. <laughs> that's a little better. Now, yeah. we still got to be concerned about the 46%. That, that we, yes, that we need to reach. Yes, because that's huge. It's that's, quite that's significant. That's still quite yeah. significant. Right. It turns out, though, even that one uh, is a little overstated. Okay. Um, about 25% of those folks uh, come back occasionally. In other words, they aren't all against the church. They aren't angry. Mm -hmm. They aren't broken trust. It turns out only about 20% of them never come back mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. Mm-hmm. That's very different than 96%. Yeah. And what's happening in our culture, Barb, is that we're getting a lot of that kind of news and it's going everywhere. Okay. And, and here's the result, right? I, I mean, imagine when everybody in a church or a pastor in a church thinks nobody wants to hear the gospel, hmm. everybody's leaving, people are apathetic, Nobody likes the church anymore. Trust is broken. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, everybody's heard the gospel, yeah, decided they don't want it. it's discouraging. Well, you know, you just yeah. keep lining up yeah. how we, this, what the statistics tell us. Yeah. And people just get discouraged. Yeah. 
And uh, I, so I even, ta I have a, you know, I use a, a phrase sociologists use called chicken little syndrome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So chicken little yell, it said the sky is falling, the sky is falling because mm -hmm. he felt an acorn. And he got everybody panicked and, and it didn't turn out well for, mm -hmm. uh, for chicken little. And the same thing's happening in the church. It's becoming less optimistic, visionary, and faith-filled that there's a harvest. Yes. Yeah. And so instead of spreading our way of life, we're defending our way of life. Mm -hmm. Instead of having hope and excitement and being on fire, the fire's starting to damp down. We're thinking mm -hmm. there's not much of a harvest out there. And so pastors are discouraged. People become passive. Mm -hmm. And folks give themselves to causes, but no longer communicate the gospel. Yeah. So I want us to talk about that, right? Yeah. I'm very blessed to be a part of a church that I feel is very healthy because mm -hmm. it has a great span of ages. Oh, that's great. It has, a, 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 it is very diverse, yeah. um, ethnically, racially, mm -hmm. um, good balance mm -hmm. uh, gender-wise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think a church has to have that, the older teach the younger, mm -hmm. like you have to have a really nice balance in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand yeah. Uh, what you're saying, and I and I, you know, I'm familiar with churches too that may be a little bit off balance in that area. Yeah. Um, but but I but I want to I want us to to to, to really kind of talk a little bit more, yeah. like well, you know, what should we be doing, right? Yes. And and a couple, yes. I I remembered, um, you know, something that you wrote in here about. Um, two of the biggest fears or concerns yes. about being judged, yes. um, in, you know, inappropriately, and I can't remember the other one. Yeah, uh, that, yeah let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're talking about uh, we're talking to Rick, uh, Rick Richardson about his book uh, "You Found Me," and this is um, research on how unchurched nuns N O N E S I keep wanting to say that millennials <laughs> and irreligious are surprisingly open to Christian faith, and uh, he's already shared with us that many of us have heard the statistic, and he shared this 96 percent statistic, uh, which is technically a myth uh, of millennials leaving the church um, and yet there are so many that are really open mm. to hearing about um, the mm. faith yeah uh, so yeah what 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 do we need to be doing or what needs to be happening what yeah. sort of I know there isn't like a formula uh, but based on what you have uh, found give us some direction here yeah <clears throat> I think one of the one of the fascinating things is uh, in our unchurched research is that 78% of the unchurched said that it, it's fine for them if their Christian friend talks about their faith. Like an, almost 80% tell us spiritual conversations are fine, having my friends, uh, Christian friends talk about their faith, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. So, and, and then it turns out only about 18% say, no, I'd rather not talk about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, talk, hear about the faith of my Christian friends. So, as you break that down, four out of five of our unchurched friends are fine with talking about faith. They're fine with having those conversations. Mm -hmm. That is, that, yes. that's okay. Four out of five. Yeah. Only one out of five would rather not. Yes. And it turns out a lot of times that one out of five has a trust issue. And if we can just ask them about that trust issue and they can mm -hmm. express it. Yeah, like what is it? Right. What, what's the, you know, what's what, the problem, yeah. right? Yeah, what are you concerned about? Mm -hmm. And often it's these two issues you mentioned. And so we have to address these two issues. Turns out many of the unchurched want to have spiritual conversations, but they're a little cautious about having it with their Christian friends because there are two things their Christian friends, they feel like, tend to do that shut the conversation down rather than helping the conversation mm -hmm. grow and flourish. Uh, one of those is judging people. So, uh, you know, just often we were trained t t and taught the way we do evangelism is we say, we're all sinners. Yeah. And that sometimes mm -hmm. is our starting point. But it turns out unchurched people don't want to hear that first yeah. from us. <laughs> And especially the one out of five. <laughs> like, if that's where we want to start, yeah. then I'd rather not have a spiritual conversation yeah. with you. Thank you very much. 
So judgment is a tough one. And then the other tough issue is feel, it's unchurched people feeling like their Christian friends expect them to be something they're not mm. and want them to get there quickly. Oh, so again, yeah. we're taught to share briefly. We're all sinners, and yeah. this, which is true. Yeah. Like I believe that. And yeah. I always say that yeah. at some point in relationships. Yeah. But even the word sinner, yeah. like I think about that word and I, th I feel like that's Christianese. It is. Because what does that really mean? right? Because everybody sort of has their concept of like what sinner means, right? Yeah. Did I kill somebody? And But the Bible says if you break the law at any point, you're guilty of breaking the law. So, yeah. you know, does that mean if I have a bad thought? Or, and so, you know, I, when I looked at the word sin, it, it really, it, it means like separation from, it means separation from yeah. God. The language I yeah. use, and again, we have to learn to the crack the cultural code yes. for nuns, millennials, for the irreligious today. The language I use is really, you know, the two great commandments are love God and love neighbor. Mm -hmm. And sin is anything that violates those. When we replace God mm -hmm. or when we hurt neighbor, yeah. that's sin. Yeah. Uh, those are the two big guidelines mm -hmm. that we have that all humanity has. Yes. And what I find in our culture that we mainly replace God with is ourselves. Mm. We kind of put ourselves at the center hmm. uh, rather than God at the center. Hmm. So my language for sin is self-centeredness or self-orientedness or self-absorption. or And, you know, there are so many applications of it. Like when you go on Facebook, for instance, everybody yeah. is taking so many selfies. Like yeah. you just begin to realize the level of self absorption we all have in yeah. our culture is immense. Yeah. So I use languages of language of self-centeredness, self-absorption, putting ourselves at the center. And I find everybody says, yeah, that really is a challenge. Yeah, I do that. Hmm. And people can own that. So the word sin doesn't mean what it used to for people, yeah. but self-centeredness can, self-absorption can. Yes. And then I try to help, I try to challenge people. Uh, that, you know, when our self is at the center instead of God mm -hmm. at the center, we're not mm -hmm. loving, we're not becoming who we're meant to be human uh, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's, we have to deal with that. And guess what? Jesus has yeah, dealt with that. Right, Jesus right. lived the unself-centered, mm -hmm. unself-absorbed life. He showed us how to do that. He mm -hmm. showed us how to live with God at the center. So there's a language we can use to talk about the gospel. Yeah. And instead of being judgmental sounding, it actually communicates and yes. people... Uh, people can embrace truth yes. when we do that. Yeah. Um, I, I also find, so for instance, sometimes churches, when they have visitors, they'll have all in Sunday, right? Like you've heard all in Sunday, all in, let's be committed, all in, let's give our tithe, all in, let's do this or do that. Well, when visitors come in, if they feel like you were saying, we got to be all in, like they're immediately going, wait a minute. Yeah, I wait, just, what does that mean? I just, like, I just I don't got know here, what right? Means. I just got like, here. what do you want, my house and I my know. car? And, you know, exactly. Right. So, yeah. so that uh, all in is not the way, right? Uh, in the early stage of the relationship to correct the cultural code. Yeah. So, yeah. but, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to say um, another you kind of this is a powerful tool mm -hmm. you know after each of the chapters there's also a set of questions and uh, whether whether you are the millennial or the nun the n-o-n-e <laughs> or the irreligious <laughs> right um, or the unchurch or uh, if you are a pastor in the church or a believer, um, there's some great, great uh, questions mm -hmm. at the end of, of each of the chapters that sort of help you to reflect um, on what you read, um, maybe kind of reflect on just where you are as well. So I think that this is a, a, a really great tool. Um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted you to talk about because it it, it seems to me, and I, I've kind of earmarked a whole bunch of places in here and I love the the charts I like yeah, looking yeah. at charts because yeah. it's a it's a great visual instead of having to look at you know all of the statistics right um, yeah save that for the statistician <laughs> that's right uh, but I love the charts and the yeah. visuals in here that might make you go wow yeah. but it seems to me um, and you can tell me if I'm wrong uh, Rick that relationship evangelism if we can mm -hmm. couch it that way or, or label it that way um, 
you know, that, that personal touch, because you, you, you alluded to that, and I remembered seeing something about, like, you know, would you rather see an ad in Facebook, yes. which was a very small percentage, <laughs> or would you rather have somebody invite you to church, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and it seemed like that got the bigger bang, yes. right? Um, and so that there's this power mm -hmm. in establishing relationships with people, um, and you talk about modeling, yeah. right? Yeah. So can you can you uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, one of the things you mentioned, and it's a surprising stat, and it shows up over the years. Uh, it's been consistent over the years. Uh, it's that fifty percent of the unchurched tell us an invitation from a friend would be effective in getting them to visit a church, and fifty-five percent of the unchurched tell us an invitation from a family member mm. would be effective in getting people to visit a church. Yes, it's right. Yes, yes. One out of two. So, you, you, you know, do the math, Barb. You think about your friends who are unchurched, and our research says one out of two of them. And again, not just our research. Yes. This has been a very validated, very reliable statistic. Yes. Say that would be effective. Now, I've had some people go, well, then why, you know, when I have invited people, why haven't one out of two said yes? Mm -hmm. And what I like to say to them is, well, it takes a little more than receptivity to get people over the threshold of yeah. a church. Mm -hmm. It also takes lowering their fears. Yeah. They're afraid they might get judged. They're afraid they might be expected to be what they're not, mm -hmm. to know Bible verses, mm -hmm. the language, act a certain way. Mm -hmm. So those are their two fears. So one of the things we teach you, you know, in the book, we, I teach it in our, we have pastor cohorts. We have, we've had 180 senior pastors mm -hmm. gather together in our pastor cohorts and we help them with all this yes. stuff. Yes. And uh, one of the things we've taught people to do is, how do you lower people's fears yeah. in the way that you invite them? Yeah. Uh, often if you get too really excited, that can be good, but they're still going to have those fears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend who, he was great. He did this the other day. He talked about, uh, he's in one of our cohorts, and he said, yeah, my next door neighbor, we've been talking a little bit. And I didn't think he was spiritually open at all, but he came over to me the other day, and he said, you know, I've been thinking about it, and... And I got a couple of kids, and I, I, I think I want to check out a church. And, and my friend was like, <laughs> What do we all want? So I know. Like, yes, <laughs> that I'll pick you up. But I <laughs> love my friend's yeah. response because he knew the fears this guy had. He knows yes. he's receptive. Yes. And I'm telling you, people are, are receptive. receptive. Yes. He knew he was receptive, but he also knew he had fears. And he said, well, you know, that is so cool. Why don't you try mine? I, I think you'd really like it. We're super casual there. I mean, you can wear shorts. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. you want to go out in the middle of the service and grab a smoke, that's okay yeah. at our church. And it's like, I thought, that's brilliant. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's what unchurched people right. are afraid of. Right. Is that yeah. they can't be who they are. Sure. Yeah. Now he didn't say, well, you can smoke up in the no, sanctuary no, right, or, right, you know, right, right, marijuana, yeah. Yeah. like yeah, nothing no, no, like no. that. You got to use some wisdom. Right. Yeah, he right, had right. wisdom. But what he did is he lowered the fears mm -hmm. and this guy came. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. And so that's yeah. what that's what we have to learn how to do in invitations. Well, and, and it's my husband and I are blessed with the privilege of working in the or volunteering in our visitor center for our oh, church. That's great. And uh, it's 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 such a powerful um opportunity really because uh, we get to it's it's almost like a a, a little mini church in and of yeah. itself sometimes yeah. um and most of the time when visitors come um i mean you'll hear you'll hear things like yeah i was looking and i looked it up in the you know the white pages yeah. or whatever yeah. i don't know if the white pages exist any longer but uh, <laughs> but most of the time it's a family yeah. or a friend yeah. that has invited them to come that's right. and they've come. That's right. And so that's, uh, you know, what you're saying, I, that, that sort of validates it. Yeah. I, I, the other thing that you said earlier, and I just want to bring it back again, and then I, you know, want you to give us some last powerful points. Mm -hmm. There's so much good stuff in here. Mm -hmm. I hope that folks will, will you know, yeah. consider yeah. using this. Um, yeah. You found me um, by, uh, by, uh, by Rick Richardson. Um, was you you kind of connected the dots and i i have i have tried to preach this if you will because i know that it it's it worked in my life mm -hmm. is when you talked about 
yes, I got saved, but I didn't get discipled. And then finally, someone kind of took me under their wing. Yeah. You know, first, first it was this connection at the college, with some intervarsity yes. group, campus group. And then you talked about small group. Yeah. Um, and our, our church does that too. We have mm. something called becoming groups. Um, mm. And there's, it's so powerful because there's greater accountability. Yeah. There's an opportunity to be personal with folks there. People can feel more authentic or yeah. be more authentic, more yeah. transparent. And then there's opportunities to, to kind of organically connect them. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to just revisit that mm -hmm. you know as you were kind of pointing this out yeah. um, so that small group piece and then that small group it's it's almost like you can see this ocean but there's a little pond here before yeah. they can yeah. get into the ocean that they yeah. feel comfortable in the pond yeah. right so uh, yeah so this relationship piece is, seems to be very critical and modeling yeah you talk about that example yeah uh, talk a little bit about that yeah so I, I'm in a lot of way there's three kind of seg you know main segments of the book and in that whole first part of the book we help you relate to friends uh, crack the cultural code understand the fears that people have uh, I share stories of my, uh, you know, the, the gay couple we kind of worked with and got to see Barry over that time come to Christ. And that was an amazing experience. Yes. And like, uh, oh, so we unpack a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and then in the second part of the book, we help churches figure out how to move forward in becoming the kind of place you're talking about, where people are reached, mm -hmm. discipled, and turn around and reach and disciple other people. Yes. So that's what we long the, to, for the church to be. And there were two key factors there. One was that churches are developing leaders who are missional. Le leaders. Yes, use who, that word a lot. I yes. Do. Leaders who reach out and, mm -hmm. and we unpack how you do that. And that's where we talk about um, how pastors have to model outreach that their people can imitate. Mm -hmm. So th just a quick word to pastors. Too often pastors like do outreach in ways that only pastors can do outreach. They do funerals, they do weddings, they do baptisms, they, you know, a couple visits their church and, and their Go marriage the is in trouble. Visit the, the hospital sick. visits yeah. or their marriage is in trouble and they set up an appointment. And, and the thing about those ways, Barb, is none of the people sitting in the congregation can reach anybody mm. that way. That's Hard, so good. None of them are going to yeah. do funerals. They're not going to do weddings. That's right. Nobody's going to come to them and say, yes. my marriage is in trouble. Can I meet in your office mm -hmm, this week? Mm -hmm. So pastors get to do a lot of outreach that only pastors get to do. Yeah. Turns out, that their people don't catch that kind of outreach. Their people go, yay, way to go, pastor. I'm so glad you led my friend to Christ or right, did this right, or that. Right. But actually, they don't catch anything. Yeah. Pastors have to reach out in their neighborhoods, their health clubs, their kids' soccer teams. Mm -hmm. their, you know, We tell pastors, office outside of your church, yes. go to your favorite yes. coffee shop, build a community. I wrote my first book, Evangelism Outside the Box, at Einstein Bagels. I asked the manager if I could do it. Uh, she said yes. I said, wait a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use your power for five hours. I'm going to write. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to eat one bagel. I'm going to buy one cup of coffee and drink it for hours. Are you sure that I can uh, write it here? And, uh, and, she, and she said, only if you thank me in the book. Well, you oh, know, nice, she a nice. very <laughs> smart move. So I did it. That became my community. I office yes. at Einstein Bagels yes. and then Good. built a community. Yes. And pastors could do that yes. one day a week. Right. And I've seen pastors do that yeah. wonderfully. Yeah. And there's a kind of a fun part of the story that, that came out of that. When I brought her the book, I'd thanked her in the acknowledgments and she read her name and she went, ah, I'm famous. And, uh, and I said, honey, I'm not famous. So you certainly aren't famous. <laughs> and, uh, but she took it to her manager who took it to his manager, who took it to the president of Einstein Bagels, who took it to all the managers of Einstein Bagels, wow. read the acknowledgement wow. after reading the title of the book Look at that. and uh, and said uh, you know this is customer service i want every one of you to do Look this and that. so because of that i'm buying every one of you a copy of this Look book <laughs> so she did become more famous Look than at, i did Look at that. well you know so. i we're kind of we we're, we we kind of oh, i i could talk about this for so much longer but we have to kind of 
you know bring it to a close yeah. but but i but i feel like the like this gem you know that we that that pastors really have to empower their people yeah. people need to be activated and you're so right because sometimes it's it's like we're you know people are sitting in the church and they're looking up at this thing happening on the platform but they 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 have got to be activated like we our church has a prison ministry and so people are a part of that yeah. doing outreach you know yeah. and but but you're so right yeah. um and honestly the people that are sitting in the pews may have more, uh, 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 they have different circles oh, of do. influence and more they opportunity do. to reach the unreached, the irreligious, the nuns, the millennials. Like I know, I That's was true. in the marketplace for most of oh, my true. life, and I had so many opportunities. Yeah. So I so appreciate that yeah. you have written this book, um, yeah. Rick. And I want to say one more time to folks that are uh, watching today that we have been talking to Rick Richardson, um, who works for the Billy Graham um, uh, Center yeah. uh, and who uh, is also a professor, um, that he has written this book called You Found Me, a new research on how unchurched nuns, N-O-N-E-S, millennials, and irreligious are surprisingly open to Christian faith. There's some really good information, great set of, of questions after each of the chapters in here. We just kind of touched the surface of it today, um, but I hope that uh, you'll have an opportunity. It's, it's, it's a good book, a good tool. We want you to know, again, that God loves you with an ever everlasting love. He says, call on me, I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. God bless you. Waiting for sunshine Out in the storm Yeah, I'm waiting for my redemption Out in the distance shines through the Sunshine out in the storm.